Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and hello to everybody who's in different time zones. I'm Mary Miller. I'm one of the consultants in palliative medicine in Oxford and delighted to be joining you and the team at Cicely Saunders this afternoon. Thank you, Irene. Good morning uh, from San Francisco. Uh, Steve Panelad here. I'm the chief of the Division of Palliative Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. A delight to be with uh, all of you again this year. Thank you. Here in Cork in March. Um, so we're all looking forward to a little bit more Harvey. Uh, good evening, colleagues. We are delighted to be here again. Uh, we are coming to you live from Kampala. It's a warm Kampala. Very glad to be on the call. Thank you very much. Department at King Hussein Cancer Center and also the head of the Psychosocial Oncology Program. Nice meeting you.
Uh, thank you so much for the, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, it really is quite overwhelming to think about how many people um, are out there uh, listening and from how many corners of the world. Uh, the, the title of my talk today is going to be uh, Intensive Caring, Reminding Patients That They Matter. And in some ways, for me, this really feels like a, a, a full circle moment. Um, I first visited uh, St. Christopher's Hospice back, I believe it was 1999. I was asked to do a grand rounds. Um, I was brought into the study of, uh, of Dame Sicily, and it was actually uh, Professor Irene Higginson, who uh, pulled up a camera and took this photograph. And you will notice that uh, Dame Sicily and I are looking particularly happy. This was about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and the only question that Dame Sicily asked me at that hour of the day was whether or not I cared for a sherry. She reached back into her liquor cabinet, which was here. These are our empty sherry glasses. And the reason we're both looking so delighted to be with one another is, uh, well, we're somewhat intoxicated, I would say. <laughs> On a, on a more serious note, and I'm going to be following this thread through the course of uh, my uh, my talk with you. Uh, of course, Bain Sicily was known for this adage, you matter because you are you, and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all that we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but to help you live until you die. And in many ways, this has become the uh, central philosophical tenet of, uh, of a palliative care. If I think about um, my own career, um, in some ways it's very much being focused on the conundrum that we see represented in this particular slide. And that is that, you know, we have students who are learning about the human body, the physiology. Um, we have healthcare providers who are interacting with the disease and trying to understand the condition. Um, at the same time, of course, Sorry, Harvey, there's a bit of a technical challenge. So we just want to make sure that we've got you all right. Do I continue from this slide then? Just give it a sec. Yep. Give it a sec. And you collect yourself. Okay. So my work, in some ways, has tried to look at, at an issue that is, uh, I would say, symbolized by this particular slide. And that is, um, on the one hand, we see people who are trying to uh, understand and engage with the, uh, the, the anatomy, the physiology, the pathophysiology. We have clinicians who are trying to understand the disease, the problem checklist. And in the center of it all, um, wanting to be seen, um, but having difficulty being seen, is the patient, him or herself. Um, and how do we put personhood on the radar? Um, in essence, I mean, much of the work that I've been doing over the course of the last few decades is trying to do this in a, a, a systematic, and empirical way. We've developed very different uh, approaches uh, over the course of years to try and make sure that the person um, isn't lost. One of the uh, earlier studies that we published in the, uh, in the Lancet in the late 1990s was the first to introduce empirical data about the construct of, of, of dignity. Uh, in the terminal ill. And in the course of that, I really came to what I considered was, was an epiphany um, on the basis of the data. Because the single most determinant factor um, that we identified uh, that told us, that uh, helped us understand whether or not an individual's dignity was upheld or not, was this notion of, of appearance or how people perceive themselves to be seen. Um, and for me, this was somewhat uh, of an epiphany, really, because what I've always thought about good palliative care being about what we did to patients or with patients along with their families. And the data seemed to be telling us that the way that we see patients, what goes on between our ears, that is the ears of the healthcare provider, is the most powerful determinant of whether or not dignity would be upheld. Now, I would say, for me, this was somewhat of, of an epiphany, um, and as a result of that, I published another article in the Journal of Clinical Oncology called Dignity in the Eye of the Beholder. And at least 
metaphorically, uh, the message that I try and convey in this article is that patients are looking for a reflection in the eye of a healthcare provider that will affirm their sense of dignity. Um, this was an etching that I discovered a number of years later by the Dutch artist M.C. Escher, um, and I have chosen to call it a reflection in the eye of, of the healthcare provider. And what you see here is a reflection of a middle-aged man in his apartment, surrounded by his his books, his photographs, his pictures. In other words, the reflection that we see in the eye of the provider is one that is affirming of personhood. Um, as opposed to a reflection that is a problem checklist, a, a differential diagnosis, in which case uh, patienthood would appear to eclipse personhood. So more recently, um, in thinking about this lecture, in thinking about uh, the Sicily, in thinking about this whole notion of, of you matter, um, it occurred to me that, well, you matter because you are you and you matter to the very end of your life is kind of the central tenet of palliative care. What we don't have and what we weren't told um, was how to actually achieve this. So is there a way of being able to remind people who feel that their life no longer matters, that they no longer feel uh, that they, in fact, uh, matter. Um, is there a way for those of us, their healthcare providers, to affirm their intrinsic worth for all that they are, all that they were, and all that they'll eventually become in the collective memories of those they'll leave behind? And as I say, this idea of intensive caring really comes out of the idea that intense, in intensive care, we know there are patients who are in circumstances where physically they are in dire straits. But we also know that people can be in dire straits emotionally, um, psychologically, existentially. Um, and do we have and can we describe an approach that will be attentive to their needs? And I have coined that approach uh, intensive caring. And what I'd like to do for the remainder of my time is to describe intensive caring, and it's an approach that incorporates variously empirically derived components that collectively describe ways of being with patients who have lost hope, who have lost any sense of meaning or purpose, and who ultimately don't feel that they any longer uh, matter. So let me go through some of these and uh, along the way, try and tell you some of the evidence that underpins these ideas. So one of the first elements that I described in this paper, Intensive Care, which by the way, uh, was published uh, in April in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And uh, to my surprise, in just the, uh, the last few weeks, it's been downloaded by uh, almost to the extent of, of 5,000 downloads. Um, the first is abandonment, and this idea uh, of uh, when we think about non-abandonment is to realize that the, the notion, the inclination to abandon is really driven by our own sense of futility and, and feelings of helplessness. If we're in the presence of a problem that is larger than ourselves, or we don't feel we have the tool to fix it, the inclination is to say, well, this is really no longer in my lane. I, I don't have an ability to be able to be responsive, and so we withdraw. And if I think back to some of our earliest studies that I began doing uh, in, in the late 90s, uh, we were looking at the notion of desire for death, and we actually reported that People who experienced an ardent desire for death actually said or experienced their families as being less available. I think we also have to recall that, you know, the you know, absent someone who cares that suffering like cancer can grow, it can spread, and even kill. Um, and Dame Saunders herself said that suffering is only intolerable when no one cares. Now, just in case anyone gets the idea that, you know, this is all sounding, you know, kind of uh, soft, uh, you know, the, the touchy-feely elements of, of medicine, as we say, I can say that despite that, um, there are very hard-edge consequences to abandonment. Um, this is uh, a wonderful study that I discovered by Kelly Trevino, who was published in Cancer about a decade ago. 
And what they reported in this study is that the patient oncologist alliance was the most robust predictor of suicidal ideation and a better protection against suicidal ideation than mentally mental health interventions, including psychometric interventions or psychotropic interventions. And so the fact of the matter is that non-abandonment has profound implications in terms of patient well-being, even to the extent of whether patients sustain the ability or sustain the desire to carry on in their lives in the face of a life-threatening or life-limiting condition. The next piece that I describe in intensive caring is that of taking an interest in the person. So if we are not going to abandon and stay by the side of the patient, then what is it that we are to do? Well, we are to take an interest in the person. We are to uh, do so by way of enhancing empathy, respect, connectedness, and of course, affirm. And that's a word that isn't used often enough. It affirm the worth of who they are, were, or try to be, and what they achieved and how they, uh, what they accomplished. Now, my work has been looking at this for some time. Um, I have spoken a little bit about uh, dignity therapy being a generativity-based intervention that allows patients in a facilitated way to deliver their story, to say who they were, and to create the legacy that they would want to stand in their stead when they are no longer here. We've also developed something along the way um, that we have called the patient dignity question, which is, what should I know about you as a person to help me take the best care of you that I can? Um, how do you study such a thing? Well, we go to the bedside of the patient. We say we know a, a great deal about you medically, but we know less about who you are as a person, as, as a human being. And so we ask the PDQ, so what should I know about you as a patient? Uh, to help me take the best care of you that I can. And in some ways, I kind of think of that as allowing the patient to choose the lens through which they would want to be seen. How do I want you to experience me? We have a brief conversation, 10, 15 minutes at most. We go off, we summarize it into a few paragraphs, and we come back to the bedside to read it. Secondly, to affirm whether or not there's any editorial change that needs to be made. And the third thing, and this is the litmus test, do you want this place on your clinical chart? I can say, you know, having done this with hundreds of people locally and now looked at studies that have done this with thousands of people, there was a, a very large PDQ study that recently came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, over 2,000 patients in their inpatient oncology service, and they found that the PDQ indeed was a very streamlined way of being able to document patient goals and wishes. Um, during the course of the, uh, of the pandemic, uh, we also decided that we were going to do a, a PDQ study. And so we now had patients who, in most instances in intensive care, were on a ventilator. We got permission from their intensivist to speak to the family member we would call the family member at home on the telephone. And I remember doing some of these. And family members were absolutely overwhelmed with this opportunity. You know, through tears, they would sometimes answer the question. You know, they could not believe somebody had called them to say, look, we know a lot about the person who's on the ventilator medically, but we know nothing about who they are as a human being, as an individual. And so tell me, how would you want this person to be seen? By the way, in our other PDQ studies, we have done sub-analysis in which we've compared the beneficial effects of the PDQ on healthcare providers, whether the information was elicited from the patient or from the family member. And the result in terms of the healthcare provider response, looking at increased empathy, respect, uh, enhanced connectedness, uh, was identical. So this is an example of a PDQ. Uh, this was a, a woman, her, this was the daughter who was now speaking about her mother who was in intensive care. And it reads, Terry wants the healthcare team to know that her mother is not any ordinary patient, but is a very special woman. Quote, since my mother was admitted, I've been struggling to find a way to share my mother's story with the staff, but my heart is so happy now that the PDQ will allow me to do so. I hope the staff read my mother's story and appreciate the life she lived. 
Um, and, and because we're um, researchers, we also provided outcome measures on a normal scale from zero to five. And you can see, although this is somewhat dated, we now have about 35 people who completed this study. Five is the highest rating. And in general, you can see everybody has endorsed these items at the highest level possible. All of them agreed to have it on their chart. All of them said it is uh, accurate. It provides important information for the healthcare provider to know. Um, I think it can provide the way the healthcare provider cares for my family member. They think it should be offered to every family member and patient. And completing it for themselves was an emotionally evocative and meaningful experience. Now, in, 19, in 2015, I was asked to be the chair of the federal committee for um, our government of Canada to do a review to look at the international experience of euthanasia-assisted suicide, what is now euphemistically being called medical assistance in dying. One of the members of our committee was this woman, Catherine Frizee, who you can see lives with significant physical disability. She has spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, what you don't see reflected in the paper uh, is that Catherine Frizee has an Olympian brain. She is one of the smartest, kindest uh, individuals that I have ever had the pleasure of working with. She is an extraordinary human being, an intellect, an artist, a writer. Uh, but listen to what Catherine Frizee says when she anticipates how she might be seen, or let me put it a different way, how she might not be seen if she were to enter into healthcare. And she writes the following, having to wear diapers and drooling or highly stigmatized departures from what is expected of adult bodies. Those of us who deviate from these norms experience social, social shame and stigma that erodes resilience and increases vulnerability. The more deeply these stigmatized accounts are embedded in our discourse and social policy, the more deeply virulent social prejudice takes hold within our culture. And here's how she ends. What assurances can we offer that the physician who treats these adults at the end of life will not stand at their bedside with horror or revulsion in his heart? So she's asking, how will I be seen? Or more to the point, how will I deal with the likelihood that I will not be seen? And when you start to unpack that, I mean, how is it that we as healthcare providers see people? Because again, we're talking about our lens. Well, very oftentimes we defer to, you know, what I will talk about the, you know, the golden rule. We say, well, I mean, how would I myself want to be treated? in the circumstance? How would I want my loved one to be treated? Which is an important adage and it's one that you find in religious traditions across the millennia. But it does mean that there is this standard uh, in which we see ourselves as this kind of infallible barometer of what the patient, he or herself, may in fact want. And we have to acknowledge that as important as that is, as an important a starting point as it is to gauge what this individual might want, it does impose an external standard. And that external standard can lead, in some instances, to therapeutic nihilism, which is exactly Catherine Verzee's point. What if somebody looks at me and says, I wouldn't want to be that disabled. I wouldn't want to be that disenfranchised. I wouldn't want to be that marginalized. And so on and so on and so forth. It can also lead to advice based on avoiding a future that the health care provider himself or herself would find untenable. So faced with these options, geez, I'm not sure that I would want to carry on. I'm not sure that I would want treatment to take place. You know, oftentimes you hear, and I'll be referring to this in the story I'm about to share, maybe it would be best to let nature take its course. Um, and of course, this can lead to great discordance regarding goals of care. If any of you are familiar with the disability literature, which is extraordinary and rich, much of it speaks about feelings of distrust and being understood and the sense of therapeutic nihilism they deal with each and every time they encounter healthcare provision. 
So, this is why of late um, I have been talking about and been writing about what I have called the platinum rule. So the platinum rule says, you know, do unto patients as they would want done unto themselves. Now, before anyone gets too worried, uh, because some people will say, well, surely you're not saying all patients get all things all times. Um, and the truth is, I mean, if somebody is kind of nihilistic and self-loathing and says, I don't want anything, that is problematic. And if somebody has expectations that exceed any objective reality, I want everything, that is problematic. But putting yourself in the mindset of the patient, saying, if there is a gold standard or a platinum standard, it is the vantage point that's contained within that individual. And it behooves us to find out about that, to inquire about it. So the first time that I wrote about this was in June of 2022 in the Journal of uh, Palliative Medicine. And then I wrote about it again in uh, JAMA Neurology. And I called this article, Seeing Ellen, the Platinum Rule. And this is a, sister, uh, uh, a picture of my sister, Ellen Chachanoff. Uh, Ellen died 14 years ago. She was born with uh, cerebral palsy. And this is a story of what happened to Ellen many years before her death when she was yet again admitted to a palliative care ward. In case anyone is feeling any degree of discomfort, by the way, I know my sister well. She would love the fact that 2,000 people out there around the world are looking at her and know her name, which is why I call the article Seeing Ellen. This particular uh, story that I tell of Ellen is when she was admitted to intensive care. Um, and she was reaching that critical brink in which a decision needed to be made as to whether or not she would need to be intubated. The intensivist came up to me um, and knowing nothing about her personally, certainly knowing a great deal about her kyphosis, her scoliosis, the disfigurement of her body, the one question he asked me was, does she read magazines? And the subtext was, we don't intubate people normally who look like Ellen. And so he was trying to get a sense of personhood. Does it make sense to move forward? Um, and it was one of the most chilling moments that I can remember being Ellen's brother. And I stood there for a moment and I said, well, she, she does read magazines, but only when she's in between novels. <laughs> So, in other words, the difficulty that the intensivist has was seen past his own biases. And that's not said, uh, meant to be said in, a, in a, an accusatory way. The fact is that we are all biased because we are human. We are raised in a way that we value certain things. And certainly in Western culture, to be young, to be beautiful, to be rich, these are the things that we place on a pedestal. And other things are seen as lesser than. And so it requires a platinum standard to confront those biases, to admit to those biases, and to start considering the patient's vantage point, which is why uh, I have seen the platinum rule now referred to innumerable times, even though it first came out in June of 2022. In March of 23, a Scientific American actually published an article about the platinum rule saying this was a new standard of person-centered care and important in considerations of equity, diversity, and inclusiveness because it always considers the patient's uh, perspectives. It helps us recognize and confront our own personal bias. Of course, in palliative care, we know that this is an important standard for substitute decision-making, um, that when we are sitting at the bedside, of an individual who can no longer make their wishes known. The question of the people at that bedside isn't, what would you want done? The question is, if we could bring that person into this room the way they were a week ago or a month ago, what in fact would they want? So it is not a, a golden rule. It is a platinum standard that needs to be invoked. And of course, that is all in the service of raising person-centered care.
Um, the next element of uh, intensive caring, and again, uh, it is available online um, and it is open access. It has to do with what I call therapeutic presence. These are qualities of the healthcare provider that are independent of what you say or do, but your aura, the essence, uh, an oncology nurse once referred these uh, as the uh, fragrance of care, compassion, empathy, being non-judgmental, authentic, trustworthy, fully present, valuing the, the work of the patient, and being mindful of boundaries and emotional resilience. And again, these, as every other element of intensive caring, are empirically based. This is a, uh, an article that we published a number of years ago in Cancer, in which we dissected, and I, and I liked that metaphor, we dissected the elements of optimal therapeutic communication. And because time doesn't allow, there is the therapeutic task, there's the issue of doing so in a safe environment, there is the personal aspect that allows us to bring ourselves into the interchange so that we have an appreciation, not just of the mechanics, but of the pathos. There's the pacing. And finally, therapeutic presence, which is where that particular element is taken from. Um, then there's the issue of, of hope and holding hope. And one element of the intensive caring is that we are the holders of hope. Um, and oftentimes, unfortunately, both healthcare providers, patients, and families often start to adapt this kind of nihilistic disposition in which further time is seen as being hopeless, of having no value. Um, my own mother died uh, last July, the year preceding her death, was not an easy year, uh, but I can tell you that it was filled with hundreds of games of cribbage at least a thousand cups of coffee and countless conversations. The point is, it mattered. Um, patients also sometimes are providing a template, if you will, as to how to die. And one of the final meetings with my mother and my daughter, uh, days before her death, and the degree to which my mother was cognizant of this or not, I'm still not certain, but my daughter was able to come into the room and thank her grandmother for the lifetime of happiness that she had brought into her life. It meant something. It continues to mean something. And it is what she takes forward in her life. And I'd like to think that it was my mother's final gift to her. The final element of, of intensive caring is what I refer to as therapeutic humility. Um, that is being able to tolerate ambiguity, accept and honor the patient's expertise, trust in the process, and avoid the need to fix. Therapeutic humility sees notions of fix, yielding to commitment to understand the nature of the patient's suffering, while creating a safe space to bear witness, to validate, and to comfort always. Um, and in some ways, the essence of intensive caring really shifts the traditional medical paradigm. And the traditional medical paradigm is we examine, we diagnose, we fix. It is what empowers us. It is what makes medicine, in many cases, so intoxicating. But we need to acknowledge that there are elements of human suffering that defy repair. Does that mean that we no longer have a place within that? I would suggest the answer is no. And if we can embrace this notion of therapeutic humility and yield the, uh, the notion of fixing, then the shift in paradigm looks like this. Intensive caring sees examination yielding to who is this person? Diagnosis yielding to understanding the nature of their suffering. And finally, it displaces this notion of fixing with being present um, and providing comfort always. Now, it has been more than uh, 50 years uh, since Stane Saunders shared this uh, wisdom informing this clinical approach. And decades later, when medicine's reach to fix exceeds its grasp, the time to consider the role of intensive caring is now. Um, just as intensive caring was designed to address the needs of patients with severe and life-threatening conditions, intensive caring offers a way for all of us, all of us in healthcare, to be with patients confronting the enormity of human suffering. Um, as I said, uh, 
Intensive Caring was just published uh, a few weeks ago. Um, there are nearly 5,000 uh, downloads of Intensive Caring from the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And hopefully, it is something that can begin to change the way that we talk about, the way that we speak about, and the way that we respond to human suffering. Um, with that, um, and this time feels like it's gone by very quickly for me, I hope it feels the same to you. I'd like to thank uh, Cicely Saunders International for the confidence it placed in me in delivering this annual lecture. Um, and I'd like to thank Dame Cicely for the inspiration that led me to uh, proposing intensive caring. And I'd like to thank the, uh, the 2,000 people out there for listening and for allowing me to discuss intensive caring. Again, I do hope that it gives you new ways of thinking about, approaching, and responding to human suffering in all its forms. And with that, I will uh, yield the floor to Professor Higginson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harvey, for your scholarship in the area and for uh, reminding us of the central principles of palliative care and, and for those of us lucky enough to work in the job, why we do it. Thank you. My question is thinking about the world in which we live at the present and the healthcare environment in which I practice here in the UK. What do you think is the first step in trying to change the culture outside palliative care? and she inside too, but if we concentrate on outside palliative care, how do we bring this learning to our colleagues? Thank you.
Great, thank you. Thanks, Irene. Harvey, wonderful to see you again. Thank you for this wonderful lecture and for this framework. Um, Harvey, you were talking, I was I'm just reflecting on the fact that in palliative care, we practice as a team and how so much of what you talked about with intensive caring is what we are able to do so well as a team um, with social workers and chaplains and nurses and physicians practicing together. And I wonder what your reflection is on that sort of on everyone's role and how that might be implemented more broadly across the healthcare system. <laughs> Thanks. Intrinsic to palliative care is this whole area of multidisciplinarity. Um, uh, and again, you know, not to perseverate on, on Dame Sicily, but when you think about her and her background, you know, the fact that she trained in social work, in nursing, and in medicine, she kind of embodied uh, that approach. And, and I think um, really had the understanding that in order to address patients in a way that is comprehensive, that is respectful, uh, and that will be providing quality palliative end of life care, one needs to, consider, needs to consider all of those perspectives, which is why I think there's been such a, a vital and fundamental role for team members. The other thing, by the way, is that when I, I, I wrote the article, uh, Intensive Caring, it is not uh, directed at or focused exclusively on physicians. Really, this is for anybody who has contact with patients and, and with families. So, uh, you know, the hope is that we can start to look at this notion of intensive caring and make this not just the mandate of physicians who are looking after patients, but everyone who has patient contact. Thanks. Well, thank you, and, and a wonderful question, Christine. Thank you. Um, so we're turning now to Mary Jane in Maribyrnong. Harvey, great to hear you from you again. Um, uh, lovely to see you again too. The privilege of hosting Harvey for a two-day conference here in March, um, and it was a wonderful experience. I think uh, a lot of our questions were were teased out during that time. My question today is along the lines, I suppose, of, of Mary's question around. I suppose today is very much preaching to the converted, and how do we? convert those less compassionately inclined or clinical colleagues who are less compassionately inclined to deliver the type of care which we feel beneficial to our patients. I guess, uh, and, and I know Mary, we, we probably spoke about this during the time that I was there. Um, you know, if, if all, and I remember, you know, quite recently somebody said to me, look, all I have is a few seconds and with, with patients. And so my response is, well, then you have a few seconds to either make a good or bad impression. I mean, it's the same few seconds, the same time will go by. So you can either be totally present and mindful and in the moment, or you can be distracted and, and, and not be present. And again, patients are going to respond to that, to your disposition. The other thing, and again, uh, I mean, we have been trying to make the argument, and I think many people have been trying to make the argument that this is the right thing to do. This is the proper thing to do. This is the nice thing to do. Uh, what I, as of late, try and underscore is that this is a cost-effective thing to do. You know, this is going to make our jobs easier and it's going to ultimately be less expensive. Why? Patients are going to be much more satisfied. Healthcare providers are going to be much more satisfied. There's going to be less incident of burnout. There are going to be less complaints. You're going to be spend less of your time in courts or dealing with litigation. So I say that I mean, people who say that we don't have the time, um, think about how much time it takes to undo all of the damage that is inflicted when we fail to be attentive to these things. I spent a lot of time with uh, patient representatives. These are the, the folks in North America where, you know, patients and families go to and they have a complaint. And they say that in the vast majority of instances, the reason that people complain is not because of medical misadventure, it's because people feel that they just weren't treated right. Um, and ultimately, you know, in, in some ways it's ironic, we train all of our professional lives to look after patients. 
Nobody wants to be treated just like a patient. I mean, they, they, they want all of the services and attention that a patient ought to receive, but they want person to be acknowledged. And failure to do so makes people feel that somehow their dignity has been undermined or fractured. Thank you. I'm so glad you asked that question. Thank you very much. So we're going to move across now um, to our colleagues um, from the African Palliative Care Association and Emmanuel in Uganda. So over to you. It's so honored to have you present. Thank you very much, sir, for the presentation. And uh, uh, we are very delighted to be part of this uh, uh, session. Uh, my question goes to the fact that we are in a situation where uh, we have quite a complex uh, setup for palliative care where professionals, uh, most of the patients are catered for, especially at the end of life in their homes, and the professional may, professionals may go there for an hour or two, and then the, much of the time is spent with informal caregivers and family members who are not uh, necessarily equipped in the, some of the things that we've talked about. And I was just thinking, I don't know that you have a view on that. How do we um, equip that army of informal caregivers and family members who spend a lot of time with the patients? And that keeps changing from patient to patient. It's not the same team always looking after a patient. I was just thinking about that. And uh, uh, I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that. No, uh, I do. And thank you. It's, it's, it's a wonderful question. Um, so how do you empower family members? How do you empower the, these informal uh, care providers? And, and I would say by, by very explicitly letting them know that, that what they are doing by being present, by being attentive, by valuing that individual is of profound importance. Uh, again, you know, the, the whole notion of, of intensive caring acknowledges that there are certain dimensions of suffering that can't be solved, that can't be fixed. But that doesn't mean that it can't be attended to. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, you'll hear uh, a family member say, you know, all I could do was just sit there and just be there. Um, there's a, a friend of my, my, my father. My father's 92 years old. He's got a friend who's in his early 90s, and his wife is dealing with dementia. And he says, you know, Harvey, all I do is I go and I visit her each day, I hold her hand, I sometimes will feed her a little bit of food, and I leave and I feel awful. And I said, Len, um, for a couple of hours a day, you hold her hand, you remind her that somebody still cares, that she is still important, that she has been and continues to be kind of the center of your universe. You see, Unfortunately, uh, and it's understandable, we put such import on this notion of fixing. And anything that fails to fix, we say, well, it, it doesn't really matter. The whole ethos of intensive caring is to say, there may be dimensions of suffering that we can't fix, but we can be with. And that is exactly what family members do. That is exactly what informal healthcare providers do. You know, um, again, on a personal front, this last year, we did not fix my mother. But with every game of cards and with every cup of tea and with every conversation, we affirmed, even though she was feeling like this is too much, you know, I, I don't matter, uh, this is getting too hard, we affirmed that she indeed did matter. So I see this notion of intensive caring not only being able to empower healthcare providers, but family members alike. Thank you, and 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 thank you, Kampa, for that question. And we're going to turn now to our colleagues in Preston and St Andrews, uh, St Catherine's Hospice. Over to you, Rosie. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Chachanov. That was a fantastic, thought-provoking talk. And um, uh, we were just talking, we really like the, the shifting paradigm and um, emphasising the importance of accompanying people and um, being present and being comfortable not fixing. Um, but with the intensiveness and the frequency of therapeutic conversations that, that us professionals are to have in our daily roles, what are your thoughts, please, on the risks um, to health healthcare professionals um, with regards compassionate fatigue and compassion burnout 
and that impacted on, on further conversations. Mm. It's, uh, it's an interesting and, and, and difficult question because, you know, in, in some ways what you're suggesting is that, I mean, ironically, could it be that we start uh, eliciting personhood, you know, if we allow people to connect with the, uh, the pathos of the work, does that in fact um, add to their uh, burden um, and can that add to kind of compassion fatigue? Uh, again, even though it sounds counterintuitive, I mean, I just have to look at my, you know, my own data and look at our, at our own studies. Um, and the fact is that when we have healthcare providers who are reporting uh, that they are able to partake of the patient dignity question responses, that they were able to read those responses and connect, you know, learn something. And in fact, in about 90% of instances, they say they learned something they didn't previously know. In fact, job satisfaction increases. Um, the fact is that, I mean, many people can and, and do sort of remain, you know, quite mechanical. I, I remember a number of years ago, I interviewed a, a nurse who was working in dialysis, and she um, somewhat sheepishly, you know, admitted to me, she says, you know, after a number of years, patients just sort of feel like kidneys on legs. And she admitted that with, with no pleasure whatsoever. She, I think she felt kind of of ashamed because it meant that, you know, one patient is very much like the next. Um, and there is, you know, it starts to undermine satisfaction. It starts to undermine connection with why we do this work in the first place. The other thing, though, that I sense uh, is that the the idea of intensive care, and even though we talk about this paradigm shift, I, I have a feeling that there also, we're, what we're going to probably discover is that there's going to be, there's a different time frame. I mean, fixing usually has a, a, a quick schedule embedded in it. Um, intensive caring, I think, probably not so much, you know, because it is a matter of, of being present, knowing that, you know, suffering will shift, it'll wax, it'll wane, and it's the ability to be present through that and respond to that that probably is going to give it its potency. Thank you. Thank you very much, and 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 thank you for giving such very thoughtful answers, Holly. So we're moving now to Northern Ireland Hospice. Uh, Deborah, uh, I believe we have you. Great. Uh, uh, Debbie's here. It's it's Dr. Matt Dory. Um, thank yep. you so so much for for your 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 talk. It was, I, we really really like your definition of dignity in terms of personhood, and that resonated with us. And I thank for the colleagues in Preston in terms of the pathos, because we were also wondering about the compassion fatigue. But our question really is regarding ethos, and in particular regarding the uh, platinum question above that of, of a, a gold question, do unto those uh, which they would do to themselves. But our question really is about autonomy and the extent of that autonomy. If that is, is a radical autonomy, uh, how do you manage in terms of uh, ceilings of treatment and things like that. And then to extend it further regarding your psych psychiatry and your Canadian background, how does that, uh, in response to MAID, because their predominant argument in terms of advocating for MAID is often that of choice. I was wondering your thoughts regarding all that. Hmm. Next question. <laughs> no, thank you for that. Um, listen, I, I can understand that you know, uh, coming from from Canada um, and with the uh, the made legislation as it is, that uh, it, it's natural that there there's likely a, a question about made, and and I would say even um, curiosity about made. Um, I, I can tell you, and again, this is not quite dealing with with the platinum rule because the platinum rule. I mean, it wasn't written uh, in in some ways. To be able to, uh, you know, support this kind of uber autonomy, it really is meant to uh, enlighten us about patients' values and and patients' goals. That really was the intent. And and as I said before, it doesn't mean that everyone gets all things at all times, but it does mean we need to acknowledge and understand where is the patient coming from. Uh, that being said, and again, you know, there is so much being written about uh, made in Canada that it's, it's hard to to get into it in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, what I can say um, certainly is that uh, I I am concerned 
Um, the original legislation was passed in, in 2016. At the time, it was to be available for people who had a reasonably foreseeable death. In 2021, uh, the legislation was changed, it was amended, um, and they dropped the reasonably foreseeable death. So May is now available to people whose death may be or may not be reasonably foreseeable. Um, there was a last minute delay of uh, legislation that this past March would have allowed May to be available on mental illness being the sole underlying medical condition. Um, there are proposals about advanced directives. There are proposals being considered for, uh, for mature minors. So what I can say is that MAID is a, a very large and continues to be uh, an unfolding study uh, in Canada. Uh, maybe lastly, and again, there, there's so much to be read. There, there was one article published by a man named uh, Alex Raikin, R-A-I-K-I-N. Um, if you're interested in hearing about some of the controversies, um, it happens to be one that is particularly well done and an extraordinary piece of journalism. Thank you, Harvey, and, and, and thank you for your frankness and, and dealing with that. So our next uh, question, the penultimate question, uh, is from the King Hussein Cancer Centre and Omar. Over to you. Yes, Harvey, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. This is really enlightening. Uh, my question is, what are the possible measurable elements or indicators that we can use in different care settings to measure the amount of caring we do or dignity and also the, uh, our staff, what our staff is delivering and maybe also on the matter of therapeutic communication. Any specific advice? Oh my goodness, Omar, this is a, uh, this sounds like an invitation to come visit you and, and have an entire <laughs> workshop. Um, uh, a uh, wonderful uh, experience. We yes. Yes, um, I mean, clearly, uh, these are, 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 I mean, there's, there's a mindset, and as well, there's, there, there's a skill set that, that, that needs to be uh, taught and, and communicated. Um, all of the things that I've done about uh, dignity, the patient dignity question, the patient dignity inventory, the platinum rule, now more recently, uh, intensive caring, I think these are all things that hopefully help shift our mindset and really make us feel very aware and, and, and understand, I think in an empowering way, Omar, about the ability that our mindset has in terms of shaping uh, the patient experience. Um, I, I can also say, and, and this is uh, somewhat off mark from what you're asking, but um, I have some colleagues who have been leading what they call the, uh, the waiting room revolution. And what they say is that, you know, we've done, we've tried for such a long time to educate healthcare providers. Maybe we need to be taking a different tact, and that is educating patients, educating consumers. Um, I don't think it's an either or. Um, I think we need to raise expectations for what patients, you know, might want and avail themselves of in healthcare. But I think it also is important that all of us in healthcare understand that. The technical skills are not sufficient. A number of years ago, I published an article in the British Medical Journal called The, uh, the ABCs of Dignity Conserving Care. Um, and I think the message embedded there is that if you're working with people, I mean, you know, we're, we're not in the automobile industry. This is not steel and metal. This is flesh and blood. And to work with people made with flesh and blood, we need to understand the ABCs of dignity conserving care, that our attitude, our behavior, compassion, dialogue, the kinds of conversations we have that affirm patienthood are important if we're going to do our job well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Wonderful question. Wonderful answer. We have one quick question in the room from Professor Joan Tino. Do you want to come around, Joan? Or well, you want to shout it over? We'll repeat it. Uh, how best to use the inventory and QI projects with humans? So the inventory in quality uh, improvement projects, when and how to do it? Over to you, Holly. Thank you, Professor Tina. Well, the, I mean, I, I actually have been 
very interested in, uh, in in seeing the patient dignity inventory used in in a variety of ways. And, and the interesting thing about the inventory, I mean, it's it's based on the empirical model of dignity, so it really gives you multiple ways of understanding distress that might impinge on dignity. So, for example, and again, you know, going back to the uh, to the question on made, can we understand? Could we use the inventory? as a way of eliciting the kind of sources of distress that are undermining someone's quality of life, undermining someone's will to live. And in, and in some ways, that question uh, and this response bring me full circle, because the reason I began studying dignity in the first place, you know, many decades back, was looking at data coming out of the Benelux countries and finding, you know, according to Dutch physicians, the reason that patients were availing themselves of this was because of loss sense of dignity. So we have now developed the PDI, the Patient Dignity Inventory, as a way of really trying to drill down what are the sources of distress and our reason for doing so. I mean, that was, it was never with a political axe to grind. It was to try and do better palliative care. I think if we can understand why somebody doesn't want to be here, for whatever reason, there's a pretty good likelihood that insights in that realm is going to allow us to do better palliative end of life care. Thank you, Joan. Harvey, huge thank you for such a wonderful and amazing lecture. And thank you to all of our sites. I think we should give Harvey a round of applause in the room and also online. And then uh, and let's do that and let you sit down and have a glass of water. <laughs> Um, and it's my pleasure now to welcome um, Professor Richard Trembath, who is King's College London's Vice President for Health and Life Sciences, who's going to um, do a vote of thanks and do the closing remarks. Thank you, Richard. Well, thank you very much, uh, Irene. I, can I just say, um, you know, you get asked to give a vote of thanks uh, at a number of lectures, I certainly do, uh, and it can sometimes feel a bit perfunctory. It has been an absolute honour to have a chance to hear uh, your lecture. Uh, I missed the very beginning, but uh, it is self-evident, and I think from the questions you've heard, Harvey, um, you have incited a great deal of excitement uh, and indeed provoked uh, some deep questions. And I, I must say, I, I certainly will be taking away uh, in my own thinking how we might think and consider how to apply some of your, your sense in relation to intensive caring, uh, the patient once again seen as a person and, uh, of course, central to that, affirming their dignity. as something we might want to consider not only in the context of palliative care, but in fact, of many of the dimensions uh, that we we are engaged in, and for me, that is very much across the entirety of our partnership, our health partnership, which we operate through King's Health Partners, our academic health science centre. Um, and I was reminded, and it was pointed out, that there was a great analogy of uh, the sentiments uh, and indeed the values you've just shared with us that are relevant to our our ambition within KHP which is to translate cutting-edge research um, and uh, make sure that uh, we move forward with existing best practice for the purposes of excellent patient care. But I think if we were to think about each of those dimensions through the lens that you have just offered up, uh, we would do very well and perhaps uh, indeed even uh, in intensify our own, our own efforts. So uh, really heartfelt thanks uh, uh, for a wonderful lecture. Um, I think I'm also in a position to just offer a, a few additional insights from, from KHP, but perhaps particularly in relation to the contributions that our palliative care clinical academic grouping uh, are making. And in that context, and our academic health science centre has, uh, I think, if not a, 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 a unique distinction, certainly uh, an important um, commitment and opportunity to connect the issues associated with mental health and well-being alongside physical health 
and well-being. We embrace that in what we call our mind and body program. And I have to say the palliative care CAG has played a central pillar in much of the thinking that we have developed, and I'm hugely grateful uh, to that. So just perhaps uh, to share some additional updates from the palliative care uh, grouping, um, who are clearly uh, excelling in many, many dimensions. On the clinical front, most recently, the palliative care clinical team was shortlisted in the uh, Health Service Journal HSJ Awards in NHS Race uh, Equality Award. And in this category, a, pro a project entitled Equitable Care for All Ethnicities at the End of Life, recognising that there are needs to adjust the ways in which we approach uh, the needs of individuals, often reflected by the communities they are, live within, are from, or, or indeed the ethnicities that they hold. And that was work that was led by uh, Dr. Sabrina Abajoa. Well, academically, um, the group continued to expand. Uh, if you have somebody like Irene um, uh, playing an important role, that is an inevitable. Um, and they have done so across core disciplines, pediatrics, nursing, rehabilitation, cross medicine and uh, engagement with health, economics, epidemiology, our social sciences and social work. Um, and most recently, it's been a great pleasure to welcome Lorna Fraser as our new professor of child health and palliative care. In research, um, absolutely delighted uh, that Matt Maddox with, from within the group is now leading a new EU funded, we still are able to access EU funding in some domains, an EU funded Inspire grant. And that brings together 10 partners across seven countries to test whether rehabilitation as part of usual advanced cancer care is clinically impactful and indeed cost effective. In clinical academic integration, Dr. Charlie Riley won a new five year National Institute for Health Research, NIHR, Advanced Clinical Academic Fellowship to test the self breath intervention working across. KCH, King's College Hospital, uh, and our university, KCL. And perhaps, but perhaps particularly importantly, the capacity and capability that our palliative care group have to have an impact on policy. And just this last week, members from the Institute presented their findings from the Better End of Life program, which has led by Professor Catherine Sleeman to a dedicated parliamentary reception. And I think just those few highlights and updates give you a flavour of the breadth of activity that this institute uh, and its associated uh, clinical academic grouping across King's Health Partners are capable of developing and delivering. So um, we're in a very vibrant period of development uh, and I'm, again, hugely grateful, Harvey, for the way in which you have, once again, I 